So hello everyone. Um, my name's uh, Jamie McCauley and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the uh, University of Aarhus um, and I've been working on uh, with the Sea Mammal Research Unit in the UK as well. And so what I wanted to do to talk today or talk about today is um, how we're using JavaFX in conservation and specifically an example where we've been using it to look at illegal blast fishing in um, Tanzania. And uh, as a biologist, uh, one of the kind of cardinal rules of giving a talk is never ever to show code on a slide. So this has been um, this has been difficult for me, and I haven't actually put any code in. So I'm just kind of showing the use case and uh, giving you a bit of background about um, this topic. So, whoops. Right. So, so I'm a marine biologist, and um, the sea is a deep, dark place. If you've ever gone diving in it you'll see that um, after, uh, maybe I can get a video going here, two seconds. Yeah, so after a um, after you go down to the first 20, 30 meters, especially if you're in colder waters, then it gets really dark. And so animals have evolved to use sound as one of their primary modes of um, sensing, of communication. So for example, uh, Dolphins, they produce these like echolocation clicks um, and they will, those will bounce off prey, they'll listen for the echoes and then they can hunt or navigate their surroundings in pitch blackness. And um, the research I do is simply putting underwater microphones in the water. So we put in, the, they're called hydrophones and we just record those sounds um, of dolphins, of whales, of many other marine species like fish, and uh, of course ourselves, humans, who make a lot of noise in the sea. So um, what can we do with those recordings? Well, actually there's, there's loads we can do with it. We can work out the number of animals that are in a given area, which is a sort of critical conservation number. Um, if we're doing things like making wind turbines, pile driving, or searching for oil, we can detect if there are dolphins and whales around and stop the activity if they get too close. Noise pollution is a major issue at the moment. Um, so that's like shipping, for example, so we can monitor noise, see how bad it is, or uh, military sonar, which actually, um, which actually kills some species of whales. Uh, we can look at behavior. So dolphins, they produce a, a whistle that's kind of analogous to a name. Um, and uh, other animals produce foraging buzzes. I mean, so we can just by listening to them, we can work out what they're doing and their social interactions. We can have big arrays of these uh, microphones in the sea and we can track how animals dive underwater, how far they're going, where they're going, why they might be going there. And then we can also use it, acoustic recordings or passive acoustic monitoring as it's called um, for direct conservation applications. So this would be listening for gunshots of poachers in a national park, or um, as I'm going to talk about, listening for illegal um, bomb fishing. So there's loads of stuff this technology can do. So just to take a little step back here, um, back in 2015, I was uh, involved in a research project that um, where, where we went to Tanzania to try and figure out um, what species um, are off the Tanzanian coastline. Uh, and in many developing nations, they just actually don't know which species of whales and dolphins um, exist there. So we've got a yacht um, and uh, there's a team of people who are very experienced in identifying um, um, animals at sea. And behind the yacht, we towed a hydrophone. And on the right here, you can see we did this survey up the Tanzanian coastline. And, um, and, and when we were listening to the hydrophone, we kept hearing these like really loud blasts, like, and we didn't really know what that was. Um, and each one of those blasts is marked there on the graph as a, as a dot. And, and uh, what, it, what it turned out it was, was it was, was a, it was bomb fishing. Um, and this is, this is just exactly as it sounds. You get a homemade bomb, you throw it in the water, you, it explodes and all the fish come to the surface. And, um, they and then you scoop them up and it's a very efficient way to fish but it kills indiscriminately and it also destroys the reef systems um it's extremely dangerous and highly illegal as well um so the tanzanian government uh 
decided that they didn't want this happening. Um, and they and and just and we wrote a report on this and that went into a sort of body of evidence and they decided right that's it we're going to stop illegal bomb fishing and they went to the fishing villages um and they arrested the people that were doing it and it was a it was a huge operation um and so after 2015 they said okay well the problem is is um is greatly reduced um and so we were invited back uh or, or we got a, we got funding to go back to um, Tanzania and to, to look at, right, has illegal bomb fishing actually stopped? Um, and so we decided that instead of towing a hydrophone array around um, like we did last time, this time we were going to put in some uh, listening stations. And these would be long-term monitoring stations. And the idea was that we would know, you know, are the fishermen doing it at night? Are they doing it on specific days? Is there different times of year that's happening? Um, and so these instruments, they would sit on the seabed and they would just record continuously. Um, and, and what we wanted, well, that's what we wanted to do. And we were constrained by this, uh, by a really tight budget. And also the fact that going out into a developed nation like Tanzania, you don't have the, um, the same sort of infrastructure that you might have over here. So there's no big boats with cranes to put things on the seabed, uh, for example. So, and get the next slide here. So what we decided, uh, so what we came up with was this system, and here's a picture of it here, and it's got three hydrophones on it, um, and it, and the idea with that is that if a bomb blast occurs, then it, it hits those hydrophones at slightly different times, so you can triangulate the direction it came from, and that lets us know, you know, was it out at sea, what kind of reef may it, may it have come from, and gives us a kind of position of the bomb, and then, uh, we had this advanced recording package, which we could just, um, which, which just sat in the bottom of the frame there, and uh, it simply just recorded, just raw acoustic recordings, nothing, nothing more than that. But it did it for 50 days, and um, the this kind of the great thing about the system was that all those electronic bits they could just fit in the backpack, so we could buy those in the UK or get them from New Zealand where they're made, manufactured. And then we could just fly over to Tanzania, fabricate this frame, which could be lifted by one person, put on a yacht, and then just thrown over board by divers. Um, and you can see some pictures of it there being deployed. So it was a really um, effective way to, to uh, collect data in, uh, in the sort of remote regions of, of Tanzania. Um, and then once 50 days were over, the device would get recovered and you would download the sound files. Okay, so um, let me just get the volume up here. So when, when, we're, when, when you download the data, you end up with just raw acoustic recordings. And in those recordings are lots and lots of different things. So we're looking for fish bomb blasts and ideally it would just be quiet and then suddenly there would be a fish bomb blast and then it would be quiet again. And that would be the easiest data to analyze. But that's not the case. Like I was saying before, um, animals use sound in the sea as one of their primary modes, sensory modes, modes of communication. So there's loads and loads of stuff going on. So here's some examples. Here's a uh, um, from from the Tanzanian reefs. I hope you guys can hear this. Um, so here's a here's a humpback whale, for example. And here's another whale like sound. Here's some fish. Uh, here's a boat. Uh, here's a bomb blast. And here's a bomb blast right next to the device. Okay. So we have days and day, months and months of data. Uh, let me see if I can get through here. Oh, doesn't seem to be able to move my PowerPoint forward. Oh, there we go. Um, so we have months, we have months of data and um, four devices, they're recording continuously. And um, how do we, and those bomb blasts, they don't occur that often. So what we're really, we're looking for a needle in a haystack here. And um, those of you kind of familiar with these type of problems might think, right, 
we could use deep learning. You know, we we know what a bomb kind of sounds like. Why don't we just train a deep learning algorithm and, and we can um, analyze that huge quantity of data that we've collected. Um, the reason that can happen is because we don't have the training data. These countries, this, I think this is the first ever um, proper acoustic survey of um, Tanzania. And so there's no training data available that can yeah, deal with all that. Sorry? I will take care. I think somebody just joined unmuted. Just okay. Um, so we can't use deep learning um, because we don't have the training data. Manual analysis, well, it would take someone years to go through the data because there's years of data and you'd have to listen to it all. And that would drive, um, as well as being a mental health hazard, uh, that would just be completely um, impractical and unfeasible. So we decided to go for this hybrid approach, which is that we used a really simple automated detector to look through the sound data. And that detector would just pick out any sound that was kind of loud, a bit unusual um, in the soundscape. So any fish, any bomb blast, I would detect all the bomb blasts and, and lots of other different things. And that way we kind of compressed the data by um, 90, over 99%. So it became way more feasible for, for someone to, to listen to it. But we still ended up with sort of 10,000 clips per 50 days by five to 10,000 clips per 50 days. And that is just way too much for someone to go through um, still. So what we decided to do was we decided that what we needed was a, a way to show a manual analyst all of these clips together. And we, as humans, we're really good at pattern recognition. So we can like, we can like see things um, in patterns and data. We can pick out little bits and pieces really well. I mean, we're still, we're still better at it than computers in general. Um, so we thought, what if we could make like a program that would allow a user to really intuitively go through these 5,000, 10,000 clips and sort of pick, pick and, and be able to sort of see, like train themselves so that we could pick out those bomb blasts by eye. Um, and that's, um, and that's sign sort. So this is the program we made and this was based on Java FX. Um, and uh, it used two two libraries, so the JMetro library, um, which is just going to be talked about, but uh, and that was for styling and making it making it kind of look nice. And then controls FX, which is just an awesome um, library with lots of lots of useful gadgets in it. And so um, and so a user would see this mosaic of clips, um, and the clips are um, spectrograms. So what was what I was showing you before. It's like um, it's just a visualization of sound with time on the on the bottom axis, frequency on the y-axis, and then the colors represent lightness. So it gives you a visual representation of sound, and then you can uh, zoom. You can pan and zoom. Um, here's a little video here because I was too scared to show it in case it, it the, um, crashed or something. Um, so here's a video of it. Uh, of what working and a user can just kind of pan through and, and look at the different signs and see something that might look like a bomb blast, investigate it a little bit further, and perhaps by changing the colors, um, and they also it also plays the clip. And then if you think it's something useful, then you um, then you can annotate it and export those clips. And so what that allowed us to do was take was take 50 days of data and it took less than two hours for a manual analyst to use this visual representation to accurately pick out all the bomb blasts in the data. Um, and uh, you can see there it's just an action. And yeah, and so JavaFX was kind of critical in making something that A, was really intuitive for, for users, kind of looked nice, and had that really smooth um, and the ability to program something that could really smooth, zoom in, zoom out, add those visual effects um, without requiring um, a huge kind of time input. It was, it was quite simple to do in Java FX. Uh, right. Whoops. Oh, there we go. Um, right. So um, I'll just very briefly talk about the results, which is that uh, using this system, we figured out that no, actually, blast fishing hadn't stopped in Tanzania. Um, it's now confined to more remote areas um, and it's massively reduced 
as a problem since 2015, but it still occurs in some of the on some of the remote and and sadly pristine reefs um, over there. Uh, I'm happy to email or send people more detailed data if you're interested, but um, we'll skip over that for now. Okay, so I just want to zoom out a little bit and talk um, more about JavaFX and what it means for conservation science in general. So. Um, and specifically, kind of acoustic science, which is where which is where I work. So, the um, this, these are harbor porpoises, and these are uh, the species I actually work with most. Um, and they produce a clip, which is 130 kilohertz. So, to record it, you need to use a recorder, which really records at least at 300 kilohertz. So that's 300,000 data points per second to to pick up the high frequency signs that these animals make six times above our hearing range um, and for ages that's been just like a really niche thing right so that's um it's it's just that it's very expensive um very difficult to do but with but now with cheaper hardware with better data storage then the cost of the hardware has just come rocketing down so we used to in the terrestrial environment bats produce the same sort of high frequency clicks and um, and or, or, or um, the very high frequency clicks as well. And, and the hardware used to cost a thousand dollars per device. And now it's $50 for, a, for an open source board, kind of like a Raspberry Pi, it's called an audio moss. Um, and so there's, there's loads, we're, we're, we've got this sort of exponential growth in the amount of data that we have, um, but we don't have, we still don't have a huge amount of training data to build automated classifiers. And we're still working on how to build the best automated classifiers. Um, and we're also working in extremely complex environments. These, these, the soundscapes are really complicated things, and especially in the marine environment, but also in the terrestrial environment. Um, and so, so we have this kind of like we have at one side we have a bunch of researchers who are who are working on automated algorithms, and those are that's going really well. But what we don't what what we need is those automated classifiers to be paired with really good visualization tools because no matter, um, at least in the medium term, we're not going to come up with an automated classifier that's really perfect, that can deal with all this complexity and um, different contexts. So we need, still need kind of human oversight. Um, and so, so, so for the future of this field in science, then sort of really good visualization tools are absolutely critical. And, and that means being able to look at, you know, zoom out, uh, have intuitive software that zooms out and looks at all big data sets and you can zoom in really quickly and see a different section investigate different bits um and this and um that that's that's how we're going to that's how things are going to move forward and allow us to sort of scale up this technology so um so here's another example of a of a java fx application that i've been working on which is um at, at sort of time acoustic data view um, viewing dolphin detections in different um, in different contexts, you have a spectrogram there, and then we can see the um, detected echolocation clips of dolphins. Um, and let me move forward here. Okay, so when we when we're talking, so so we need this good visualization software, but when we talk about soft, when we're trying to make software, we often end up, especially when science, certainly we often end up with this idea of like flexibility versus complexity. So if we have really flexible software, then it's quite complex. So the kind of limit of that is a programming language. So programming language like MATLAB is very flexible, um, but it's also very complex because it's a programming language and um, biologists can't just learn, um, or you know, a lot of people aren't just gonna learn a programming language, uh, especially in biology. So we, um, and, and then there's a whole scale that goes down. You have really simple programs that don't do much, and then you have everything in between. But if you have good open source collaboration and good user interface designs, then you can sort of make something that's still pretty flexible, but also more intuitive and less complex. And in, in our field, in science, um, that is something that not many people do at all. Um, and it's a real, it's a real gap. So, um, so if we can make that software, oh, then I uh, don't know why I've gone forward there. I seem to be not able to control this. All right. 
there we go. Um, if we can make that software, then we get more data, we get more monitoring, and we get we get better conservation. So why is Java FX in science? Why why you why would we use Java FX for that? Um, or why do I think we should use Java FX for that? Well, it, there are alternatives like Flutter, Swift, um, but the thing is, is that all of those are sort of focused on 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 apps um, mostly, and really, um, actually, we, we don't really use that in science. We use def we still stick with desktop um, because we just. I mean, I guess that is a legacy thing, but also because. Really, these devices, touchscreen devices, they don't have the functionality that, that we need. We need sort of pro software. Um, so that's an important difference. And the other thing is that Java has this vast programming library. It's been, it's a, you know, that's been decades in the making. Um, and we don't, we don't want to use software that, um, like, you know, we don't want to be changing languages and things like that. We just want something that's simple um, that is powerful like JavaFX um, and, and, and compatible with all these, these amazing libraries that people have made. And so a good example is if you just try and search for like a spectrogram in Flutter, then I couldn't find, I couldn't find a good one online. Search for spectrogram in Java and there's loads of stuff, including in JavaFX. So, so why is JavaFX really, really good for science? Well, I think it's because you can build really good visualization tools you can build them fast and you can take advantage of the whole java ecosystem um, and that really makes it the technology of choice um, hmm. so what would we like to see when we move java fx forward um, i think it's a it, just keeping it sort of supported um, and um, uh, it's a nice, it's kind of becoming a mature technology now, and that's that's really good. Um, I was interested to know whether there would be good integration with the Mac M1 processor, because that looks like with all the neural engine and stuff in it, that it'll be a really good um, a processor for science. Um, it could improve the audio library. I keep meaning to email someone about that. Um, and also just to keep the awesome community, which over the years of working in JavaFX has been absolutely fantastic. So um, thank you very much for all the work you guys have been putting into this. And it's just, I hope this talk has kind of shown you how useful um, this technology is for us. Uh, and um, yeah, and so I'm continuing to use JavaFX and hopefully developing a completely new graphical user interface for a long-standing program that's used to detect dolphins and whales, but I won't go into that just now. Um, but it's still the technology I really prefer to use, and I'm quite excited to see what we can do with it in the future. So thank you for your time. Um, thank you especially to folks at or J Metro and the folks who make controls FX. Um, and yeah, I have no idea how much time I took because I've got a bit of timer on, but I hope that was okay.